All right. So thank you, everyone, for participating today. It's great to have you all here. Um, this is the first installment of the American Psychology Law Society Student Committee webinar series. Um, as many of you may know, APLS is uh, Division 41 of APA, and we're focused on issues dealing with psychology and the law. So this webinar series was really developed to allow our student members to interact more with professionals within the field and also with each other between our conferences. Um, a secondary goal is to give all of our members really useful and relevant information for the difficulties of graduate school. So today we are very uh, pleased to be presenting with Dr. Patricia Zapp. Um, she does a much better job of introducing herself than I will, so um, I will let her go ahead and do that. I am Casey LaDuc. I'm chair of the APLS Student Committee, and I'll be your moderator for the day today. So a few uh, points. As Patty is talking, if you have questions about what she's saying or just general questions overall, please type them in the chat box. You can talk if you want, and if you would like to, to ask your question out loud, just let me know, and I'll be able to unmute you when we get to that point. Uh, we hope to have a very interactive webinar. It's kind of the point of all of this, so please do participate. Uh, without further ado, I will present Dr. Patricia Zass. Thanks, Casey. <clears throat> Thank you. It's nice to be here. I really appreciate being asked to give this webinar. Um, I see that my camera is freezing, um, which is always very attractive. So I think I'm going to turn off the camera for most of the time that I'm going to be kind of chit-chatting, and then I will um, t turn it back on to answer questions, etc. And if I, yeah, I'll try and remember to do that. So I'm going to turn it off right now, make that a little bit bigger. And um, yeah, so I'm really happy to uh, have the opportunity to present a webinar uh, for the student committee. I can't say enough great things about our student committee. Um, they are leaders in many, many respects, um, doing a be far better job at some things uh, division related than the rest of the division. So thank you, Casey, and thank you, Megan. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, kick off your webinar series and think it's a great series, by the way. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself first and then um, maybe kind of <clears throat> launch into kind of some of the messages that I have, I guess. And um, I really, um, when Casey asked me to present this webinar, he pitched it as a, a fireside chat kind of um, approach. And so that's really the approach I've taken. You'll see um, it's not a typical kind of presentation that I usually give uh, where my slides have far too many words on them and, you know, too much information. I'm really trying to kind of focus in on what I think is uh, an important message and one that um, I guess I didn't really consider too much in grad school and I wish I had. And so kind of looking back on what I know now and kind of trying to impart some, you know, wisdom uh, for moving forward from your grad school career on. <clears throat> how not to become your worst nightmare. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in terms of what, what my worst nightmare is and sort of where I'm coming from when I'm uh, giving that title. Um, Self-care, self goal setting, and the importance of continued professional development. Um, a little bit about myself here. Let's see. Okay, a little bit about me. Yeah, so on the right, that's me on my very best day, having my hair and makeup fully done and looking lovely. I never look like that in real life. Um, and then in the more center is myself and Ron Resch, who was my uh, graduate school mentor, my dissertation advisor, and is still a very close friend and collaborator. I continue to collaborate with him uh, even though I'm uh, 15 years out of graduate school, and, uh, and he's just wonderful. I have him to thank for um, my career successes, I would say. Uh, in terms of my career, I started my career at Simon Fraser University in Canada. I still have a bit of a Canadian accent. 
Um, that's just the way it is. I've been in the United States since 1998, um, but I still have some of that. So uh, Simon Fraser University, for those of you who haven't heard of it, is a Canadian university just outside of Vancouver. And uh, it's got a very well-known psychology and law, forensic psychology program. Uh, it has both the clinical and the non-clinical tracks and really is kind of one of the leaders in terms of um, uh, prototypical programs for psychology and law. I uh, completed my PhD at Simon Fraser University. I did my internship training at the University of South Florida, Florida Mental Health Institute, uh, which is an internship that is no longer in existence, unfortunately. It was a great internship uh, uh, consortium of sorts uh, with many different um, training opportunities and then a research component, which is what kind of drew me to that internship. I've always kind of been research oriented, um, much more so than treatment oriented. And I'll talk a little bit about my practice now, which is um, all assessment. Uh, after completing my degree, I went to the University of Alabama, where I started my academic career and uh, have only great things to say about that school. I was in the psychology and law um, doctoral training program at Alabama on faculty with Stan Brodsky and Carl Clements at the time. And, um, and then we brought Randy Selikin in and that program has expanded and continues to grow and is a great, wonderful program. And I was very fortunate to spend the first three years of my career there. And then I got recruited from the University of Alabama to John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City, which is my current appointment. I'm a professor at John Jay College and went there in 2002 to help develop a doctoral program. Uh, at the time that I went, we didn't have a doctoral program in forensic psychology or um, clinical forensic psychology. And so I um, went there and really helped build that program from the ground up. And I'm very proud of that program. As many of you know, that program's been in existence for a number of years now. And we are on the cusp of getting accredited and really kind of um, uh, taking that program to the next level. So I'm very fortunate to basically have been at three of the you know top programs in uh, forensic psychology, psychology and law. Um, so I'm very lucky in my career. My primary area of expertise is competency to stand trial, criminal competencies, um, the evaluation of. So I have been very fortunate to do a lot of research and do a lot of writing on competencies, the conceptualization of competencies, best practices in the evaluation of criminal competencies. I'm really lucky because everything that I've done in my career all kind of merges together. I teach forensic assessment, I have a forensic assessment practice, and I train students uh, in terms of forensic assessment. I do professional development training on forensic assessment, and I do research in the area of forensic assessment. It all kind of comes together for me really nice, so I'm really lucky in that way. Um, top couple books here are a Canadian textbook and then a US-based textbook that I uh, was involved in writing. Um, the bottom corner is the Evaluation of Competence to Stand Trial book in the Best Practices series by Oxford, which I was involved in writing, as well as the Forensic Assessments in Criminal and Civil Law book for lawyers. And then these other two um, pictures are uh, Encyclopedia of Psychology and Law. I was the associate editor for that two volume um, book series. And then um, the forthcoming APA Handbook of Forensic Psychology, Brian Cutler and I also uh, co-edited that. So, and that's coming out soon. So I've been fortunate to kind of have everything come together for me in terms of my teaching, my research and practice. And these are some of the products of my practice um, and teaching and research. As um, most, as, as everyone else, I have multiple aspects to my life. And so I'm also a wife and a mother. And so my son, Max, is six and he's in grade one. <laughs> and he's fun and challenging and hilarious and all of that. And my husband and I have been married for uh, just about 17 years. This, this uh, 
New Year's Eve will be 17 years. So I'm lucky to have them in my lives and they are the reason that I do what I do. I also am a runner and a triathlete, and so I've been so lucky to take place, uh, take part in many events and to place in some of them. I drag my family out to do the turkey trot. I um, drag my sister-in-law out to do half marathons. Um, Ron, Resch, and I always run the student, uh, the APLS student fun run and the International Association of Forensic Mental Health Services fun runs together. Um, and so that's something that I've done since being a graduate student and continue to do to this day. Eve Brank and I, who Eve is the uh, treasurer for the American Psychology Law Society, we trained for the Half Ironman in Puerto Rico a couple of years ago. Um, it was just fortuitous that our conference happened to be at the same hotel that the Ironman headquarters were at. And so we decided that we couldn't let that opportunity pass. So we both trained for it together, but separately. She lives in Nebraska. And so, um, and we finished and uh, it was a hot, crazy day. And uh, I had tears crossing the finish line because I was miserable, but it was, it's all good. Um, and I also am Canadian, as I said, so yes, I play hockey. Um, and we're getting our son into hockey. He starts this September, but he's been practicing. And so my husband and I play Sundays for a team called Crown Royal. My husband's a twin, and so that picture, the biggest picture there is uh, his brother came to visit, and so we had his brother play with our team as well. So I had my two, my two Parfit boys with me um, playing hockey on our Crown Royal team. And then, of course, we go out for beers and food afterwards every Sunday night. So that's, that Sunday is the play day. We, we ride 30 miles on our road bikes in the morning, and then we play hockey in the evening, and it's a, a great day. And I am very, very lucky because I split my time between New York and Florida. So I work in New York, and I have my appointment at John Jay College, uh, which is in New York. And so I get the wonderful opportunity to be up in New York. And then uh, eight years ago, I left New York City and moved to Florida. And so for the last eight years, I basically telecommute to my job. Um, I work online all the time. So, you know, geography really isn't relevant anymore. Um, and so I think you can have people doing things from anywhere they are. And so that's what I do. I split my time. I travel up to New York usually once a month. Um, and teach in person there when I'm there in person, and then I teach online in real time just like this um, through webinar platform uh, the rest of the time. And when I teach undergraduates, it's all online and fully um, asynchronous. So it works well for me, and I go back and forth between Florida and New York. Um, when I talk about, when I was thinking of a title for this webinar, I was thinking, okay, um, how not to be your worst nightmare. I, it actually was very relevant for me because I had just uh, been involved in a case where I was testifying on an individual competence to stand trial. And um, the, one of the reports that was written by another evaluator in the case um, was just really miserable. It was poorly written to begin with, but that's beside the fact. It was a case where the individual was, um, has intellectual disability or mental retardation, long-standing history. Um, this evaluator didn't look at any of that history, didn't look at any of the functional or adaptive functioning components, and basically opined that not only was he um, not mentally retarded, but that he was doubting that he was psychotic, which he had a long-standing, well-documented history that didn't change over seven years. And so anyway, what kind of got me thinking was the fact that this person really kind of naively and unknowingly got on the stand and was, you know, in deposition. It was crazy, the responses that he was giving. It really was a case where he just didn't know what he didn't know. And for me, that is my worst nightmare. Um, you know, you spend so much time and investment and energy in this field, and then um, to come to a point where you don't continue to develop your skills, you don't continue to develop your um, education and training, you kind of just become complacent, and then, you know, you don't have goals, you don't have a clear direction, and you kind of lose yourself a little bit, I think, professionally. And in my mind, sort of the worst nightmare is not knowing what you don't know. So not only are you not, you know, on top of your game and sort of keeping up with the field, 
but you really don't even know it and you're kind of just lost to that and it just became so evident to me that this is what was going on with this other uh, psychologist that it just got me sort of thinking and I have two messages and they're both kind of intertwined and you'll hear about them as we move through this year of my presidency um, with APLS but the two messages are continued professional development so high quality professional training and continuing your professional development and then translating our work for various audiences, translating our research into practice, getting our work out there, having others who need to know about the information be able to understand it and digest it and so us really putting it out there for them. Um, so in this case I decided okay so we'll talk about how not to be your worst nightmare and sort of everything I wish I knew then what that I know now for um, taking care of yourself and really sort of becoming the best that you can be as a professional and a person. So self-care. So one of the things that I wanted to do was do a little poll. Um, so there, I have a poll question where I basically want to ask how many of you out there right now are, take, are telling yourselves that I'm in grad school, I've got a million things that i got going on, I'm trying to keep up on all these assignments and all these readings and classes and do practicum experiences and, um, you know, supervision and everything else that i got going on. How many of you are telling yourselves that I'm going to wait until my real life when I get my job after graduate school and that's when I'll start taking care of myself? That's when I'll start eating right. That's when I'll fit in time for exercise. That's when I will be, you know, taking care of myself and making sure that I'm really functioning at my best as a person. But right now, I'm just way too busy with everything I got going on. And so, yeah, I'm slacking on certain things. Okay, so right now what I'm seeing is about 50% of you are saying, that's me. I'm waiting. I'm kind of telling myself, like, eh, well, I'll wait until we're finished grad school or out into a job or have some sort of structure to my life that's different than the way it currently is. And then in the chat box, if you could put in some of the ways that you take care of yourself, what it is that you do to take care of yourself. So just type in some responses. I want to kind of get a sense of, um, of, of what you're doing to take care of yourself. So one thing is that um, we are mandated by our ethics code um, to take care of ourselves, right? This idea of self-care is an ethical imperative. It's referenced in Principle A where our ethics code, APA's ethics code tells us psychologists strive to be aware of the possible effect of their own physical and mental health on their ability to help those with whom they work. Uh, Standard 2.3 tells us about maintaining competence and says that psychologists undertake ongoing efforts to develop and maintain their competence. And then 2.06 talks about personal problems and conflicts. And there's two sections to that. And one of them is psychologists refrain from initiating an activity when they know or should know that there's a substantial likelihood that their personal problems will prevent them from performing their work-related activities in a competent manner. And then when psychologists become aware of personal problems that may interfere with their performing work-related duties adequately, they take appropriate measures such as obtaining professional consultation or assistance and determine whether they should limit, suspend, or terminate their work-related duties. So that's all well and good. Um, we have an ethical mandate to take care of ourselves and practice good self-care and to maintain some self-reflection and insight into sort of when we're functioning uh, less than optimally and when that might be impacting upon our clients, patients, people with whom we work, students, etc. I kind of want to move past the ethical mandate piece of things and just talk as, you know, on a more personal level in terms of my experiences and what I've learned over the years. And if I could go back and tell my 20 or 25 year old self, you know, what to do to sort of become the best that I can be and how to take good care of myself. I, I, you know, yes, we're mandated ethically to take care of ourselves, but I think really sort of getting at what that means. Um, it can be so easy to just get so busy with everything we have going on that we just forget to take care of ourselves. Um, as psychologists, we know, even if it's academically, because I know not all of us have great levels of insight, myself being one of them, I do not have great sort of body awareness about things 
sometimes I'm trying to get better at that. I'm trying to continually improve. But even academically, I know academically the importance of self-monitoring and self-awareness. So I think we know that as psychologists, where you know, professionals who are getting trained in this field, um, we are expected to understand the importance of insight and self-monitoring and self-awareness. But it can be really hard to remember to attend to our own physical, emotional, and spiritual needs when we have so much on the go. And, you know, I'm 15 years out, but I remember grad school days easily. I remember having so much to do and so much going on and needing to be in a million places at the same time and really letting myself kind of slide and not taking, my, not taking care of myself, not going to the gym, not eating well, not drinking water, not getting enough sleep, all of those things that we know we're supposed to do and we know we should do, but, you know, it takes time and effort and careful planning. And so um, I think it's really important to kind of underscore the message of self-reflection on an ongoing basis um, and the importance of being honest with ourselves about the impacts of our stressors on our well-being and our functioning. Um, I think it's important to know our own personal warning signs. Um, when I look through a list of some stuff that APA put out in terms of self-care and warning signs, they talk about warning signs in terms of boredom, anger, daydreaming, wishing you were somewhere else, ending sessions early, arriving late, missing or canceling appointments, feeling fatigued, feeling a loss of enjoyment, having low motivation, impaired sleep, self-medicating, so using drugs, take, you know, drinking, whatever it might be. Um, and I think those are pretty typical um, strategies that people use to um, kind of uh, escape. And when you start feeling burned out and overwhelmed, it can be really easy to kind of slip into that and not be taking good care of ourselves. Um, there are a lot of self-care strategies that we can use to ensure that we are keeping ourselves at our very best. I'm going to look in the chat box here, and I see a bunch of messages in the chat box here. Um, Let's see here. Try not to work after 7 p.m. That's really good. Having work-life boundaries and kind of, you know, everything changes and everything's fluid in life, but I think that's an important um, component of things is remembering that my personal life is just as important as my professional life. Going to the gym, working out definitely. The physical benefits, but also the emotional benefits are you know, there's a, a whole body of research on that. There's a body of research on yoga and meditation and how good that is for not only our physical health, but our mental and our spiritual health as well. Spending time with friends and family. Uh, one night a week without worrying about school. That's a great idea. For me, Sundays is my sort of play day. Um, if I have, you know, if I'm really busy and everything, you know, life is fluid and Everything kind of happens in different times. And so, for example, this year as president of this organization, it's a busy year for me. And so my balance is tipping a little bit more in terms of work, but I'm cognizant of that and aware of it, and I've made that choice. And so I'm also careful to stack up a bunch of other things on the other side of my scale to balance that heavy work commitment. So exercise is even more important to me now, eating well, drinking water, maintaining friendships and uh, relationships with people, um, not isolating ourselves. Red wine, absolutely, I love that one because that is me. Um, yes, red wine is a great um, stress lever, antioxidant, all the rest of it. Monthly massage is going to bed at 11, love it. Spending quality time with my two-year-old and fiance. Netflix, making time to hang out with friends and watch pro wrestling. Embarrassing, but takes my mind off of everything. Hey, whatever you need to do for an escape, I love it. Wedding planning, um, exercise, watch TV, something non-work related. Spending time with family and with my dog. Uh, pets, keeping involved in a project I'm passionate about. Great self-care strategies, all of them important to make time for yourself to do things that you enjoy, take care of yourself physically and mentally, and we all know the whole list of things that we're supposed to be doing, getting enough sleep, getting enough water, getting the right kinds of food, getting exercise, um, maintaining relationships and friendships, having good work boundaries, and 
you know, someone like me, I love what I do and I do what I love. So I maybe from the outside seem to work a lot of the time, but really I enjoy it and I'm very, um, I try to be very good about having boundaries for the first number of years. For the first 10 years, I, I absolutely did not work weekends or evenings and I just kept my, you know, my time to an eight hour day. Now that I'm here in Florida and I work from home, I have a really different schedule, very flexible. So I work seven days, but I don't, you know, work, you know, so many hours on each day. Other day, some days are heavier than others, etc. And and that's what works for me. Um, so just being aware of needing to have boundaries and needing to have time outside of our profession. Um, I found this avoiding halt, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I know that I get hangry, like when I'm hungry, then I get all like crazy and it's just not good. So um, trying to eat well, trying to maintain a good emotional balance, not being lonely, so maintaining relationships, getting enough sleep. And then also I think it's important to tell yourself and be very mindful that self-care is a good thing. Not only are we mandated to do it in our profession, but it's, it's like a personally good thing to do. We need to give ourselves permission and just simply make it a requirement for our optimal functioning. Wiz Khalifa, I'm a big fan of rap music. So work hard, play hard, work hard, play hard, work hard, play hard, work hard, play hard. Love the song. Uh, my personal motto is work hard, play harder. Um, and the, the harder I'm working, the harder I'm playing. So the more work I'm doing, then the more t um, time away I'm trying to have to do fun things and things that I enjoy, going on vacations or, you know, exercising and whatever that might be. Um, it's well known that a person's current physical health, lifestyle, mental health, influence their reaction to life's current stream of events, right? We all have stressors. They're good. Um, they may be good. They may be bad. They may be happy things. They may be, you know, upsetting things, events, but they're all considered to be stressors. And how we handle those really is influenced by our physical health, our lifestyle, our mental health. And so I think it's important to consider time management. I see time management as the key to self-care. Um, weak time management skills, if you're not good about managing your time, and then you have a hectic schedule that results in a loss of sleep, uh, or no time to relax, or skipped meals, a poor diet, lack of exercise, uh, make you feel overwhelmed and make you feel not in control of your life. And so I want to spend a little bit more time talking about time management. Um, and I think going along with time management is the importance of goal setting. So how many of you set goals for yourself? I have a little poll here I want to see. Um, and then we'll talk about five-year plan, 10-year plan. But just in general, how many of you set goals for yourself? And then once you've registered your vote on the poll, in the chat box, can you tell me what kinds of goals you set? Good. So we got like 88% of you so far right now who've registered voting are saying that they set goals for themselves, which is awesome. And then in the chat box, just use the chat box and tell me um, when you, what types of goals that you set for yourself. I think that, um, you know, goals are key to getting things done and to moving forward and advancing our personal and professional lives. I think it's important to have short-term goals and it's important to have long-term goals. It's important to have personal goals and professional goals. Um, if you read, you know, I've got a bunch of these books, whatever, Unlimited Power by Tony Robbins, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Personal Development for Smart People, all of these kind of self-help um, uh, books about increasing your productivity and, in, well, you know, what smart people do, what effective people do, how to be effective in your life, they all talk about goal setting. Goal setting really is a, a foundation upon which to build you know, your personal and professional development. Um, I have this book on here, The 4-Hour Workweek. This is a book that really um, 
spoke to me. I read it about eight years ago and I have been implementing the principles in it. It's a business oriented book and so you know it's definitely something to read on your own time and it, it's, you can apply the principles to any profession and so it really talks about sort of working smarter not harder, goal setting and you know um, and how important it is to set goals. Going along with that I would say goal setting is important it's equally important to be able to say no. And I know as a graduate student, you're thinking, yeah, right, like there's no possible way I can say no to things that come my way. I need to like have all of these experiences. And I agree. I agree that as a graduate student, it's important to have experiences and it's important to kind of take advantage of all the opportunities that you can possibly take advantage of. But I think that if you have goals in mind, those goals can help you evaluate each opportunity that comes your way. And then you can decide whether to say yes or no um, within the context of whether that helps to further your goals. If you don't know what your goals are, then you're going to say yes to every opportunity that comes your way. And it's a difficult thing. You need to consider opportunity costs and all the rest of it. Everything is finite. So anything you say yes to means you're going to have to say no to something else. And so I think it's important to kind of set goals and be mindful of your goals when evaluating opportunities that come your way. I just want to look here at some of the goals that you guys are setting. Oh yes, okay. Dissertation related goals. When currently working on dissertation, short term goals on manuscript submission, small goals to get schoolwork completed, long goals is when to obtain my master's. Yes. Small goals to get, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Finish my, when you finish the dissertation, yes. Always a big one. <laughs> um, keep involved in pas projects you're passionate about. Um, yeah, okay, finishing your dissertations, keeping up with weekly readings, getting organized, getting stuff done on time, absolutely. It's good to have goals, personal, professional, short-term, long-term, and those goals will really drive um, how you think about um, evaluating opportunities that come your way. So in terms of uh, one of the favorite sayings I have is, um, you know, from Gandhi where he says, action expresses priorities. So if we have our goals that by, by their very nature define our priorities and then we can put our, into play our actions which basically express our priorities. Um, when, when we think about self-care and we think about trying to fit everything in and time management, um, I think that one way to deal with that overwhelm is to think about goals and goal setting and priorities and time management. Um, so I kind of think about in terms of inner chaos, if you have a million things running around in your mind about what you have to do and what you have to get done and assignments and papers and dissertations and all of these things, inner chaos creates outer chaos. And so I think in order to deal with overwhelm, one of the things I, I do is that I know that when I start worrying about things and when I start feeling overwhelmed, that is my early signal. That's my warning signal to start working smarter, not harder. So I immediately list all of the projects that I have to do, the deadlines and the priorities. It helps me basically, I can prepare a short to-do list for each project. I can identify problems, I can identify scheduling conflicts, I can identify where I might need some more information or some more support, I can prepare an action plan, and I can get to work. So when I start to feel overwhelmed and start to feel like there's a million things going on and maybe my balance, uh, my scale is tipping a little bit too much in terms of me not being balanced and getting a little bit too crazed with work, the first thing I do, and I, I'll tell you my, my three steps, the first thing I do is I write everything down on paper. It creates a mental white space. You basically, I write down everything that I need to do. All the big projects that I have, all the little projects that I have, the little things that I want to do or need to do but I never really kind of get around to, they just stay in my head, like make a doctor's appointment and all that kind of stuff. I basically write everything down on a, paper, on a piece of paper and then I categorize each item. So the first step is to write everything down and that just clears out your head and gets it out on paper. Second thing is to categorize. And so basically I categorize things in terms of it has to be done within the next three months, it has to be done this year, or it has to be done in the next five years. 
I cross off everything on my list that I can't categorize into one of those three months, one this year or five years. And anything that doesn't excite me or help me move in the direction of one of my goals gets crossed off the list. I just need to say no to it. It's just not worth it for me to try and fit that in because there's going to be opportunity costs where if I try and do that, I'm not going to be able to do something else that I want to do that will bring me closer to achieving my goals. And so I categorize everything and then I cross off my list. All of those things are not essential to to moving forward with my goals, to reaching my goals. Um, so basically, I take all of those things and then I calendar them. I, I stick them on my schedule. And literally, if it's not on my schedule, it doesn't exist. Um, and you know, you have your own different way of categorizing, but I think, you know, for me, I color code. This is not actually my schedule. This is from Google Images. but. But literally, I will schedule everything. I will schedule time to hang out. I will schedule time to go on social media. I know in the morning, that's when I get up and I kind of have my coffee and I flip through Facebook and I go on LinkedIn and I read you know, articles and blog posts and all the rest of it that I find interesting and you know, professionally related, et cetera. But that's my time. I, I, I literally schedule things in. I schedule workouts. You know, I think that time management really is the key. You need to block out time in your calendar and just do it. Um, if you have milestones, firm milestones in your calendar, then you stick to them. You basically set deadlines for yourself. In grad school, you know, a lot of deadlines are set for you. So you have those in your calendar. It's no different when you're doing it for yourself. Basically setting those goals, setting those milestones for yourself, I think makes 100% perfect sense. Sit down at your calendar and simply map everything out in advance. If there's tentative events that you're thinking about, conferences, etc., put them on the calendar as tentative events, but they're there, you can see them and you can work toward them and decide at a later date whether, it's, whether you're going you're gonna to make that happen or you're going to say no to that. If we're guided by our goals, then we can schedule everything in that we need to and we can say no to the things that we don't need to. Um, and you're going to include both personal and professional goals, short-term and long-term goals. One of the goals that I believe you need to include in your professional development plan is just that. Um, is professional development, continued professional development, lifelong learning. Um, this really is the sort of formula for future success in our field, in every field. We need to nurture ourselves. We need to grow as professionals. See here, I found this on Google Images as well, but the continued professional development cycle. So planning, what am I going to do? When am I going to complete it? Action, you know, what have I done? What, where, when? Evaluation, what have I learned? How, is, how does this impact my needs and objectives, my goals? And then reflection, you know, moving forward in terms of what are my goals, what are my objectives, how can I continue to move myself forward as a professional? Um, I, you know, these fall off a little bit, I think, for a lot of people once you leave graduate school, right? In graduate school, we're so used to having our professional development structured for us um, that it kind of falls off a little bit. But if we're mindful of personal and professional development and the importance of taking good care of ourselves and the importance of reflecting on where we are, where we've been, where we're going, what our goals are, how we can manage all of that by scheduling into our calendar, we can really think proactively about our continued professional development. And I think a lot of professionals kind of fall short on that, on that front. Um, I've seen it with professionals that I work with, and you know, these are, would not be people that I'm close with and know well, but these would be people that I testify against or evaluate uh, on the other side of and you know uh, um, that I uh, go and train for you know forensic examiner trainings in different states that I'm working with. Um, I see that there are many people who either didn't get really good professional development in forensic psychology in the first place, which you know is a lot of people, right? Most people who are doing forensic psychology were clinical psychologists, trained as clinical psychologists, and then have tried to get that forensic knowledge and experience after their graduate programs. 
but um, if you're not doing that in a planful way or you're, you know, or you don't know what you don't know, then that becomes a problem. So um, in terms of right now in graduate school, what types of things are you guys, use the chat box, what types of things are you doing for continued professional development? What types of activities are you engaging in for um, moving your knowledge, skill set, and level of expertise forward? If you put some of those in the chat box, that would be great. Um, I think that those same experiences that you're using in graduate school, so yes, attending professional conferences, twofold, right? Not only can you maintain competence and learn new things and stay on top of the research and the practice in a particular area, but you also maintain those relationships with colleagues and friends. Like most, I have a good number of friends who are also my colleagues, but you know, we hang out and we do things together. And so conferences are one of those opportunities to really meet with people and uh, go for dinner and hang out and, you know, do triathlons or whatever it is. Um, I think that it's important to, to maintain those relationships in that way. Um, reading journal articles, right? In grad school, you're basically forced to read journal articles because you're taking co courses and you have readings for your courses, et cetera. Um, and so there's really not, um, there's nothing forcing you to read journal articles once you finish grad school. And so that's an area as well where I see a lot of professionals just aren't keeping up. They're not, you know, they're aware of what the journals are, but they're really not reading journal articles. They're not um, doing that kind of sort of continued professional development on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And I, I know it's because they're not scheduling that into their time. It's not a goal for them, and it's not something that gets scheduled into the calendar. Um, reading books in a particular area in which you'd like to develop, you know, so when you first start out, it might even be a book on developing a practice and the nuts and bolts of forensic practice. Um, as, you, as you're involved in your forensic practice, you might want to become more specialized in a particular area. So selecting and reading books in a particular area. Oh, you know, the other thing for professional development really is um, reading for pleasure in a professional area of interest. So I already said that I do what I love and I love what I do. So it's easy for me to read, you know, blog posts and um, different pieces of information in an area that I find interesting. So forensic psychology, um, professional development, all of these areas, I, you know, it's, it's fun for me to read um, personally, um, you know, information that's sort of on a personal level. It's not, I'm not reading it professionally. It's not journal articles and books, but it's, it's other stuff that's out there on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all the rest of it that kind of is coming my way in RSS feeds. So I'm actually kind of curious about where you guys are looking right now for that type of information. So when you're reading information, if it's from the APA website or if it's from APS or, you know, if you have, um, I just, Karen Selican, we were just in Tuscaloosa this past weekend going to the football game, and Karen Selican, who's in our field and does a lot of capital work, was telling me about a blog called Stand Down Texas. And so it's, uh, you know, started following that blog, and it's got all sort of the latest information on capital punishment. And so um, if you can, in the chat box, kind of give me some ideas of where you're looking for that type of reading, but, you know, it's not necessarily professional, it's not, not law review articles or books or, or journals, it's other stuff, it's other articles that are written for the general public or an academic audience or a, um, a professional audience, whatever, but kind of comes through different sources. Also a really good way to continue your professional development. Okay, so <clears throat> the half-life of knowledge is an interesting and important concept. Um, and I know that we're coming up to our just about the end of the meeting. I don't have very much more here. I just want to kind of run through a couple things and then I will give you guys um, opportunity to ask questions or whatever. Um, Half-life of knowledge is interesting. Uh, what this refers to is the number of years that it would take for half of the information or knowledge in a field of study to become defunct or superseded by new information. And so of course it varies by field of study, it varies by area, half-life of knowledge for two well-developed areas of medical um, specialization, so hepatitis and cirrhosis. 
has been calculated to be about 45 years. So it would take about 45 years for the half for half of the current knowledge in that area to become outdated or superseded by new information. In the chat box, tell me what you think the half-life of knowledge for forensic psychology is in our field. How many years would it take for half of the information in our field to become defunct or superseded by new information? Come on, I don't see any numbers going in that chat box. Thirty years, five to ten years, forty years, ten years. In some areas, yearly. Um, yeah, I bet that's true. Ten. So good guesses, pretty much all over the board in terms of guesses. Half life of knowledge in our field has been estimated to be so forensic psychology has been estimated to be seven and a half years, seven point five. 8.3 years for police psychology, um, and uh, the future half-life estimate for forensic psychology is 6.6 .6 years, and for police psychology is 7.2 years. So really, right now where we're at is without any additional professional training or development, our knowledge base falls to about 50% within seven-year periods. So if you think about me, I'm 15 years out of my degree. So really, I mean, a lot of what I learned at the time that I took courses in forensic psychology is change, no longer applicable, you know, advanced. So a perfect example, when I took courses in forensic psychology, and I'm one of the first two Simon Fraser graduates in forensic psychology, um, we talked about dangerousness. And then, you know, that kind of moved to risk assessment. And then it moved to risk communication. And now we talk about risk management. It's, it's an evolving field. Even, even with respect to my own competence to stand trial area, um, different case law has come down. The standard is the same, but the interpretation of that standard is very different. So we continue to evolve and move quickly forward in this field. And as graduate students, you know, at the time you graduate, you have got more information than you will ever know about the field if you don't continue to develop your skill set and your knowledge and your expertise. So it's really important to continue to develop your knowledge, to develop your skill set, to develop your expertise, to um, professionally um, advance yourself and your skills. You can't just think that you're, it'll happen. I'm going to go to a conference here and there, and I'm going to be able to stay at the top of my game. You really need to think about your competencies, do some self-reflection, do some evaluation, Think about where you want to go, what your goals are, how you're going to reach them, and don't just assume that you're going to go into practice and, you know, I'll gain all this experience, which you will, but, you know, and whether that means your practice is academic, research, teaching, clinical practice, like I'm talking practice broadly, if you aren't planful about your continued professional development, you won't continue to develop. Um, the last, basically the last thing, two, two more things I want to leave you with. Uh, one is, you know, three easy steps to taking care of yourself or, or to, to, to advancing yourself. One is take care of yourself, right? Put your own oxygen mask on first. Make time in your schedule for self-care activities, very important. Um, the second is set goals. Uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will lead you there. So you really need to Set goals, think about where you're going, think about where you want to head in terms of your personal life and in terms of your professional life. So set your professional goals and then move forward with continuing to develop yourself professionally. And then I've got Steve Jobs and Michelle Obama here and the message that both of them are giving is basically stay true to yourself, figure out your goals, stay true to yourself and don't worry about anyone else. Don't worry about what anyone else has to say. Uh, I hope you're not offended by this, but I love Lil Wayne, and so one of his songs, Good Cushion Alcohol, talks about, long as my bitches love me, I can give a fuck about no haters, long as my bitches love me. So figure out who your bitches are, and don't worry about anyone else. Your family, your friends, the people who are loyal and true to you are really all that matter in this world, and you stay 
true to yourself and it's all good. You will continue to move forward. And I want to end with a big thank you to the student committee for all of the work that they do, all of the wonderful work that they do and push us forward in so many ways and inviting me to be part of this webinar series. And I'd like to just open it up now for the last 10 minutes to see if anyone has any questions or wants to, um, yeah, ask anything. I'm totally open, happy to give you um, answers or my perspective on, on anything. Don't all speak at once. Chat at once. So everyone can be sure to write in your questions in the chat box. A question that I wanted to ask that might uh, be on some of your minds too is that I think if we had the choice, we would all choose to take care of ourselves. Um, how are you able to demonstrate a commitment to self-care to others, like your academic advisor, while not trying to seem like you're unreliable or lazy or selfish? You know, I think as long as you, I think it's all in time management and scheduling. And so I know that academic advisors have, you know, um, put a lot of, um, not constraints, but yes, constraints, but a lot of um, expectations on students and, um, and that's always going to be there, whether it's an academic advisor, whether it's, um, you know, a, a, a supervisor, somebody that you work with or work for once you've completed, whether it's your department chair or your, you know, the clinic manager. Um, there's always going to be someone who's putting demands on you, and I think really it's, it's okay to say no. You know, it takes some skill, and I think it's important to be able to say, I'm not going to be able to give this my, you know, my full uh, attention, or if it's something that's important, you can schedule it in and just, you know, be clear about communication in terms of when you can get to something, when you'll be able to, to fit it in, but then also, you know, truly scheduling in time for yourself as well. So, you know, your academic advisor, you're not sharing your Google calendar with that person. They don't know exactly what you're doing when. I think as long as you're demonstrating that you're competent in moving forward and making progress on some of the things that they ask you to make progress on, and then be clear in your communication about when you'll be able to get to something else or, you know, having to decline invitations because you just simply can't give it the care and attention that it requires. I think that those are, that's perfectly fine. I think that that's acceptable. And if it's not acceptable to that advisor, then, you know, you need to sort of take that with a grain of salt in your, um, in sort of the overall grand scheme of things. Okay, let me see. You alluded to this earlier, but does your class schedule get easier, less busy after graduate school? My loved one tells me I work too much. I tell them I won't always be like this. I hope I'm not lying. I'm thinking of an academic career, but not fully, not that fully committed to that. You know what? I think it, one of the hard things for me to sort of figure out was that, you know, my, in graduate school, that is your real life. And, um, yes, things get easier in some ways, but then there's just more commitments and different commitments and things change. And so, you know, you finish graduate school, so you don't have the classes and you don't have those types of expectations and limitations on your time, but then you're trying to get tenure or you're, you know, trying to build a practice or you're, you know, trying to build a research program. So there's always things that take your time. It's just you know, figuring out what your goals are and prioritizing things and then being able to say no to the things that don't help you further your goals. So, um, yes, I think in general things get a little, I have to say grad school was probably the craziest time in my life. And then once I graduated, there's always going to be demands. And I think as I, as I kind of got a little bit older, I became better at saying no and scheduling time and making, you know, just getting tighter with my schedule and um, putting it all sort of on the calendar and working towards things. So, um, yes, I think it gets a little easier. It just gets, you know, it, it gets different. It's different. So I think it's just important to have the skill now about uh, being able to take care of yourself and schedule and good time management and all of the rest of it. Uh, can we connect later on if you more experience, uh, if more questions related to your success, experience as a forensic psychologist? Absolutely. My email is patricia.zaff at gmail.com. 
Um, and you could probably just Google my name and I'm sure you'll find an email address at some point. All roads lead to Rome with me, so I've got a John Jay email address and other email addresses. They all come to Gmail. So yeah, find me, send me an email. I'm totally happy to, to talk and chat and share. Um, thanks, Casey, appreciate that putting my uh, email on the G on the chat box. So yeah, I'm totally open and so happy to chat and talk. And if you, you know, if you see me at a conference or if you see me out there, come introduce yourself, say hi, and I'm, I'm happy to meet and happy to chat. All right, so we're gonna get a question from Gina now once I find her on the list. Here we go, I'm about to unmute you, Gina. I guess I'm not, sorry. <laughs> so Gina, why don't you type it in? Well, Gina's typing her question in. Um, the other thing I think that is important, I see the, the names on the list here of attendees and I see that there's a lot of women in attendance. It's hard for women to say no, and we've got lots of other commitments, and not that men don't, they do, but women are especially vulnerable to saying yes to things, to taking things on, to sort of, you know, feel bad about saying no, and um, it's a, definitely a skill that takes some practice, but it's an important skill to have. Is there anything you found that helped you become as organized as you wanted to be? Uh, really, for me, Google Calendar. Google Calendar is what helped me be organized. I basically just started calendaring things in, even my, even my workouts, you know, really sort of just calendaring my time and then living by my calendar, which, you know, in, in some ways it's great because it, I can be flexible if I decide that I need to do something and this is more important than something else I had scheduled. Um, at rate, you know, I, I got a lot of things on the go. Um, so for me, I live by my calendar. That's really sort of what helped me become, become organized. How do you balance life immediately after graduation? Graduate school, trying to work your first job, trying to become established, but also trying to build a private practice without having to work 24-7. Well, you may actually have to schedule time in to sleep, and you may have to schedule time in to go to the gym, and you may have to schedule time to, like, literally, I try not to work from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock because my son's home from school, and then he's got martial arts, and then he's, you know, then I'm making, trying to get dinner together, and so... I just give myself permission that between four and eight, that's my family time. It is what it is. And yeah, I got shit I got to do, but it's going to have to wait until eight o'clock or tomorrow or, you know, the next time I can slot it into my schedule. So I, I try and know, you know, it takes a little bit of uh, experience to sort of know how long you're going to take to do certain things. Um, it's also freeing in some ways because if I've got a two-hour workshop to give, I know that I should prepare for that workshop, but I don't want to spend, you know, four days preparing for a two-hour workshop. If you schedule things on your calendar, you basically are forced to get it done in the time that you've scheduled. So um, it takes a little bit of practice, but it's, it's a good skill to have. Um, I think it's important. Great. Thanks, Patty. So it looks like we're out of time. I want to thank everyone again for participating today. I uh, hope you learned some good things that you can pass on to your peers. This has been recorded, so we can um, send out the link later if anyone wants to go back to it. You can also go back up to the chat box and get the slides themselves, download them right on your uh, computer. The next webinar is going to be in October. It's to be determined, but the topic will be on uh, how to work effectively with difficult clients, either challenging or um, clients that you're just generally having a hard time with. So we look forward to seeing you all then. We'll be advertising it very soon. And I'd like to thank Patty Zeff one more time for her willingness to help out on this project. Thanks, Casey. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for attending and uh, have a good rest of the day. See you later, everyone.
Bye-bye.